just in order to save time and be efficient, uh, I would begin to <laughs> like to begin on time. So again, welcome back uh, to a panel that is Fortunately, I will say, on a much less dramatic issue <laughs> than, than the first one, but nevertheless, I think an important one because it's uh, for central banks, for academia, all the things that uh, relate to how to interact independent authorities with the legislator, with the ones that have the political responsibility of making the rules, it's quite important. And I will say that in the very complex construction that is the European Union, and yesterday we had an echo of <laughs> the, this complexity, uh, this uh, matters that could be seen as technical and and soft because it's a lot about use of soft law are in fact the oil that can make uh, this complex structure work in uh, in the most efficient way because complexity of course is uh, the this issue is to be able to perform efficiently the functions that uh, you are doing that. And this is why I just wanted, before I introduce the members of the panel, just to say why for the ECB, and in particular for the part of the ECB I am working it, which is uh, the banking supervision part, I am a member of the board of uh, supervisors of, uh, that was created with the banking union, uh, it is in fact an extremely important issue, this issue about how we can interact with the ones that make the rules. And, and, and particularly for banking supervision, because when you, uh, if you uh, compare with my colleagues on the monetary side, on the, the monetary side, you have received a very, very difficult task, which is uh, the monetary stability and financial stability in uh, the whole of uh, uh, the, uh, the monetary union. But this is not applying a law. <laughs> this is essentially a task. You have some legal means to do it, which is uh, settling interest rates, but it's not essentially <laughs> applying a law on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, so. Here, the issue is how to interact with the general policies. <laughs> it's policy interaction <laughs> between uh, uh, someone that has an independent policy task and the others that have the general policy task <laughs> in, the, in the European Union. With banking supervision, we are in a quite different situation because from a legal point of view, our task is just applying the law. <laughs> we are there to, to be the guardians of the law. I will not say that it's true. I mean, I mean that, that, that's the, 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 the thing of supervision is not to just uh, rule by the book. Uh, uh, supervision is also a task, and this is why it is, in my opinion, of course, biased, uh, very uh, good that it is integrated in, the, uh, in a central bank. It, it is because also all about financial stability. I mean, we are applying the law, but with a purpose. The real purpose is doing that. I, I we have some colleagues, by, by the way, uh, that uh, are making the history of supervision in the United States that are saying, uh, have a very interesting idea that supervision is about owning the responsibility <coughs> for some parts of the financial stability issue. <laughs> uh, and if uh, now there is a trend to give more autonomy, more independence to the supervisors, is because of that. <laughs> because we want to have an autonomous owning of responsibility in these matters <laughs> of supervision in order to be supervision is a tool for the task also. And in this resembles monetary policy. But again, the dimension of applying law is much more uh, pregnant for us. I will say, um, well, we are in the, in the process of doing our annual report on banking supervision, but uh, so the number of, of not, uh, is not exact, but we are applying more than 3,500 decisions a year. I'm speaking about legal decisions, <laughs> not only, uh, but for instance, fit and proper uh, uh, applications in the banks, uh, authorizations for banks, so, so it's a lot. <laughs> so it's a lot. I mean, so, so really our day job is to also to see the articles of the law and applying them <laughs> on, uh, on a way that is conducive to our mission. Huh? So the way the frameworks are done are essential for our mission. But and in this, by the way, it's a bit different than uh, what's in the national law. 
We have no regulatory powers at all. And even not the powers of trying to make convergence on the application of regulation, because these are done, done by the European Banking Authority or colleagues. We are very close to them, but we are not. <laughs> so in fact, we are maybe an example, maybe the more pure example of a pure supervisor <laughs> that has only been transferred essential supervisory tools, but very few regulatory tools. In fact, when you look at the, what says the SSM regulation, it says, the, you can only use your regulatory tools to organize your supervisory functions. <coughs> the regulation is pure. So the material, the substance of what we supervise, we have no power to define it. Hmm? Legal power to define. Day-to-day -day life <coughs> makes it a very, very essential role for us. So it's clear that uh, for us, it's particularly important <coughs> Uh, to be, to have some place where to say to the people that are doing the rules what we think, <coughs> uh, what we can take from our experience, <coughs> what we think is conducive to a really efficient uh, delivery of our mission. Mm. And so that's why we are very, very, uh, I will say, uh, eager contributors to ECB opinions and, <coughs> and, and all the other instruments uh, uh, that we have. And, just as a matter of introduction, say, say what, why it is so important. It is because this is the occasion to do both two things at, at the same time. First, to deliver a message. <laughs> the message is about the adequacy of this piece of legislation to the or task, hmm? to the mission that we have to preserve uh, financial stability. But it is also, and it will not surprise you because we are in the European Union, <coughs> complex manufacturing, a European message, how to do it <coughs> in a way that fosters integration in Europe, because this is what we are paid for, <coughs> to foster the integration of the markets in the EU and in the banking union in, in particular. And this is not easy because we, are, we have a complex uh, structure. The second point is to be technically constructive for the co-legislators, because precisely the co-legislator pack structures are those who have not the experience of supervision, we are <laughs> the supervisor. So I think it's very important to be even detailed and technical, uh, technically precise in our contribution. So um, maybe that explains why our contributions, of course, cannot be read very easily, <laughs> because <laughs> they are very technical in its nature. Eh? Uh, but it's always a way to try to have a constructive interaction with the regulatory function. And this constructive interaction is a key for the efficiency of the whole. So if I take the, or th the three last uh, happens that we work on it, uh, and just to, to give you an example, we had the, the opinion on the banking package. Banking package was the core of, <laughs> of uh, our task. It is the directive and regulation that defines what we are supposed to, uh, to implement. So of course, this was an, an extraordinary important piece of legislation for us, which was the transposition of uh, what they had negotiated at the Basel Committee. By the way, interesting enough, the Basel Committee, of course, is rather the supervisors that themselves <laughs> give a proposal to, uh, to the ones that have the legal power to make the rules to say, well, this is what we think is, <laughs> is, uh, will be a, a nice rule. Um, so, of course, here, the first message that we delivered to the European co-legislator was, we think the, the banking package uh, should be as faithful as possible to the International Basel <laughs> Agreement. Hmm? The National Basel Agreement was an agreement among supervisors. Then we can perfectly think that the legislator can have other ideas and, and do other, other things and take uh, into account specificities. But it is our role to explain why, as supervisors, we thought that was a good thing and why we thought it is an essential thing of course, in an industry like banking, that is a worldwide industry that have already been <laughs> for more than 100 years a worldwide industry to preserve the public good of a, a consistent in international regulation is a key issue for stability and for supervision. That was really a message. <laughs> the other point, which will not surprise you, is in our role as supervisors, we have to apply day by day, day by day, <laughs> not general, national law also. 
Mm. Uh, because <laughs> we are the supervisors not only of completely unify the regulation with call CRR, but also <laughs> the, uh, the parts that are in directives. Mm. And by the way, in the regulation, there are also options to the member states. So uh, you have something like it, like, but less massive, but something like you have in the directive. That is, there are principles that are European, but then the, the, re the regulation, the law, the regulation that we are applying is national. So, of course, for us, we are in charge of 21 um, nations' uh, supervisory shows to to increase the convergence of the national legislation is an essential task. <laughs> and there are a lot of things, but, um, mainly, mainly, by the way, where the, I would say the legal tradition of each country uh, is very, very pecu peculiar, it's very, 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 very entrenched, uh, rooted in national history, where it's difficult <laughs> to, uh, to move. Two examples I've worked with, sanctions, and fit and proper because it's corporate law. Here we are in situations where it was extremely divergent into the nation. So of course, the second message we had to the, to give to the legislators try to to push and to make it more uniform like that. By the way, I think we succeeded at the in sanctions very much fit and proper. It was very difficult, but we have succeeded a bit, if I understand what is the, the um, political agreement at the end of the day. But okay, that was a, a absolutely an existential issue for us uh, to, to give this opinion and to intervene. Second point, we have the AMLA package, and I take it because it's exactly the opposite. So you you have not, and you have, and the ECB has said a lot of times that they doesn't want to be an, an AML supervisor. So why are you interested in it? <laughs> you were saying that uh, you shouldn't be there. Yes, but we are looking for efficiency of supervision. So we very much welcome the creation of a European supervisor for AMLA, and we think that or experience, we are the only <laughs> precedent of real European supervisor of day to day, that uh, we need to work very closely together, precisely because we thought it should be different. We are very interested in designing it in a way <laughs> that allows to build on, the on our experience, <laughs> but uh, essentially on synergies with us. So for us, it's a big deal. It, it's something that we are really, really very interested in it. By the way, it's certainly the, the biggest step ahead in the in integration for the banking market uh, in Europe that is really at hand. So we have to foster it. <laughs> so same time, we have the same thing. We did the message, and we have made a lot of suggestions. And some of them we find them in the Parliament, in the in the Council. So I, let, let's see <laughs> what's come of it. But uh, it's important for us. And the last one that we uh, work on it is uh, on the crisis framework, CMDI, <laughs> uh, for, uh, uh, for the ones who know it, the, uh, the reform of the crisis management framework. And again, here it's very important for us for two reasons. Uh, this is a message. First, because this is the road to completing the banking union. And we were created for the banking union. <laughs> we are the first step of the banking union. So uh, we are really impatient to see it <laughs> completed. And this is not an easy task. And what is the way to progress is the CMDI. So we wanted to show the importance, global importance, because th this could be a Ice meal, very technical reform, <laughs> reform of uh, uh, points for treating specific, uh, because it's not a complete overhaul. It's, uh, it's a bit of pie meal reform of the crisis framework, but this is very important. Um, we really want to give the message. If we want to keep rolling in advancing integration, this is an essential thing. <laughs> and this is why we try to show, because it's a field where it's not easy at all to advance, um, try to show that at least we, we are a, very broad image of the banking union. We have the 26 competent authorities because some so, some countries have more than one on our table. So we were able to manage to see this is a technical way that we can propose to to support this uh, this um, uh, proposal to make the progress that it's necessary to keep uh, uh, the the banking union on, on its road. And again, we. Always, when we give this opinion, I mean, we are not just giving an opinion just to say this is what we think. For us, the opinion is a tool. It's a tool to give a message and 
technical indication of how we can do it. And it is also a message to say we are ready, we are available to speak with the co-legislator to, uh, to try to discuss things, to uh, the, the issues, because there are issues, of course. We are not in the decision-making part, and this is how it is. This is uh, uh, the framework. But I think that the, to try to put the results of the experience of applying the law in the design of the law is good for both parts, <laughs> for the ones that do it and for the ones uh, that are applying. And, and, and again, for us, it's really an existential issue. So that's why for us, it's very important that we will be uh, discussing also, uh, also in this panel. And to discuss that, I, I really have the pleasure <laughs> To, uh, to introduce you to uh, our panelists that are very, very interesting one. I, may I begin with uh, uh, Diane, uh, Diane Fromage. What I wanted just to stress for her, <coughs> she's now professor of European law, law in, the, uh, in a very nice place, Salzburg, and the Paris Lodron <laughs> University in Salzburg. And, and here you are really the, the deputy director for European Union studies. And I know that you were, after uh, um, what you did in, in Sciences Po and in Maastricht, uh, quite a city for, uh, for the banking union, um, you are working a lot on the economic and monetary union, and especially on the banking unions, of course. I'm quite happy to have you here uh, to, uh, to give us your view, your analysis of uh, this in kind of interaction. We have also David, David Ramos Muñoz, who is a professor at the University of Charles III, Carlos III, in, uh, in Madrid, but also collaborates in Bologna. And uh, what I will say also that is very, very important that of, uh, he's, uh, he has a big experience on working on finance there and even also practical experience eh? because uh, he is a, his alternate member of the panel of the single resolution board or fellow <laughs> in charge of the second pillar of, uh, uh, of uh, <coughs> the Banking Union, but also on the Joint Board of Appeal of the European Supervisory Authorities, which, by the way, are the ones that have these tasks that we don't have about the convergence, <laughs> uh, uh, the, the technical support to the Commission for, for the regulatory part and the convergence of uh, uh, supervisory things. So, so quite, uh, also quite a relevant experience for, uh, uh, for our matters. Uh, and for the third, Miguel, uh, how to say, but he is working at our church, so, <laughs> so, which is, you, everybody knows here, uh, the, the essential role that uh, uh, the judiciary has taken in, uh, in the creating of all kinds of European unions, <laughs> and so also, of course, in the, in the monetary and in the um, uh, banking union. Um, even if I, I think you, uh, you will precise it, you're not direct ru ruling <laughs> on us, but uh, really I think that your, your work after a, an extensive uh, experience at the member state level in uh, interaction with the judicial in the uh, European Union, but uh, uh, your role in, in, the, in, the, in the court, uh, the, the general court, which is the one that, uh, that goes for uh, of first rulings of uh, all 3,000 decisions <laughs> I was uh, speaking about, uh, is of course absolutely essential. And, to see how in this matter, which is uh, always delicate, a mandatory uh, consultation, it's, uh, it's always delicate because uh, you have to balance the fact, in mandatory consultation, what does that mean? That someone that is not the legitimate authority for decide should be heard. <laughs> this is what you're saying. So, so really you have to need a balance between um, having a process that is really useful for both parts, <laughs> for the one that is just giving the advice and for the one that is receiving the advice. How you uh, balance the mandatory part with, <laughs> uh, with the one that is not is, is a crucial one for this efficiency. And so I think <laughs> we will learn a lot of it. So if not, whether do, maybe we can begin, because uh, Diane, you, you have prepared uh, an overview of all the, the opinions. So I think it's the best to begin by that. Hmm?
Yeah, no, thank you very much for this kind introduction and thanks very much to Chiara as well as Antonio and of course uh, Edouard for this opportunity to talk to you about um, a topic which I think has not received a lot of academic attention, which is that of ECB opinions on um, national legislative proposals. So the way I'm going to look at this Okay, yeah, thanks a lot. So, um, as has been anticipated by Edouard, what I'm going to do is I'll, try it, I'll start with an introduction in which I'm going to, well, look at the legal framework, but also at the aim of those opinions, then I'll turn to practice. And um, in conclusion, I'll, well, draw some uh, conclusions on the impact of those opinions of the uh, European Central Bank, but also try to look forward as to how this procedure uh, should, in my view, continue to uh, evolve moving forward. So, as is known to all of you in the room, basically since the creation of the ESCB, there is a duty uh, for the European Central Bank to be con consulted on um, any proposed Union Act uh, in its fields of competence, but also uh, by national authorities in um, its fields of competence, although the Council is there uh, to define the, condition of, uh, the conditions of this uh, duty set on national institutions. At the same time, um, the ECB can also, on its own initiative, submit opinions on any uh, national or European uh, legislative proposal. So we have this uh, dual possibility um, for uh, on the one or this dual uh, duty on the one hand for uh, EU and national institutions to consult the ECB, but also for the uh, the possibility for the ECB to adopt uh, its own initiative opinions, which uh, allows it, uh, in my view, to then uh, compensate for in the EU institutions and the member states. Uh, deliberate or genuine failure to consult the ECB. Um, but the, the question maybe I'd like to raise here is whether uh, this hasn't set a burden on the ECB, because in the, that would, um, I think, uh, at least looking at it from the outside, necessarily imply that the ECB then follows up on uh, all legislative um, uh, evolutions within all member states. Uh, so what is the aim of this uh, consultative or advisory uh, um, role of the European Central Bank? Well, as we've just heard um, by, uh, in the introductory statement, essentially that allows the ECB uh, to provide expert advice to ensure the compatibility of the national measures and uh, to ensure their suitability to contribute to the achievement of the ECB and the ESCB objectives, and also to guarantee their alignment uh, with the euro system, the ESCBs and the ECBs uh, policies. So that uh, uh, beyond this, it also allows for the sharing of information and expertise because, um, as I will um, emphasize further on, basically because it's a governing council um, opinion, essentially there will be a, a spread of information and exchange of information also among uh, central bank experts. Uh, it fosters harmonization, as we've just heard. Uh, it's a useful source of um, reference for the Court of Justice, but also for national courts. And uh, finally, it contributes in, to the ECB's communication function and also to its uh, to, towards transparency. Um, so the the conditions of these um, well this ECB's advisory responsibility vis a vis member states is then detailed in the Council decision. Uh, of 98, as I mentioned, but also uh, in the guide to consultation of the European Central Bank by national authorities regarding draft legislative provisions that was last updated in uh, 2015, where we have a definition of uh, draft leg legislative provisions. Um, and here I'll only emphasize that um, Basically, the measures that uh, are taken at the national level to transpose EU legislation are excluded from this duty to uh, consult the ECB because the ECB has already been consulted by uh, the EU institutions. There is also uh, a distinction that's being made between euro area and non euro area member states, whereby the duty for uh, euro area member states to consult the ECB is uh, larger or broader. And um, there is a minimum period of one month that is uh, set for, uh, for the ECB to deliver its opinion, uh, although in practice um, it's not always uh, respected. Um, and um, then there is also a duty for uh, the member state to take the measures necessary to ensure effective compliance with uh, the council decision. 
Now, moving on to practice, which perhaps is the most uh, well, original part of my presentation, um, you see here the figures uh, for, of the, the total number of opinions uh, so far, so uh, starting from 1998 until uh, today. And there, um, well, we see very clearly that the share of opinions adopted uh, regarding national pieces of legislation is much larger, as is only uh, logical, of course. But if you turn um, to the evolution uh, over time, uh, well, we see very clearly that there is a peak in the number of opinions uh, between, uh, well, 2008, 2009, and um, essentially 2015, which uh, corresponds to the financial crisis. So I think it's, well, very unsurprising to see this peak. Um, what I think is well, also quite interesting is that um, despite the, well, the number of member states uh, having gone much larger uh, after 2004, and we are still well, going back to figures that were pretty similar to the, uh, the ones we had before the enlargement. So um, that's, I think, also quite an, an interesting uh, finding. Um, then, if we consider the, the topics on which uh, ECB opinions are uh, being adopted, we see very clearly um, at the, on the right-hand side that um, well, there is a much larger number of opinions that regard uh, financial market stability, uh, and then this uh, followed by issues uh, related to institutional provisions and um, bank notes as well as, pay as uh, payment systems. So we see quite an imbalance in the various uh, areas on which the ECB delivers its opinion. Moving on to um, practice and the, the divide of opinion per member states, and that's uh, again, um, is a representation of the number of opinions uh, well, from the beginning of the ECB. So uh, I think it's quite interesting again to see that despite the fact that some of the member states joined much later than others, we don't see this clear divide between well, newer member states and older member states. Um, because if you look at the figures, well, we don't see um, huge differences. Um, on the other hand, we do see um, well, some cases standing out, um, and I've tried to come up with some hypotheses as to why that might be the case. Um, so if we look at the, the member states uh, circled in yellow, which are um, Cyprus, Greece, and Ireland, my suspicion is that it's also got to do with them having been former uh, crisis countries. Uh, whereas uh, Hungary and Poland, well, are member states that have notably introduced uh, quite a few um, well, initiatives or proposals for reform of their central banks, and um, and generally, um, yeah, there, where there have been tensions, where I'm not quite sure yet about the interpretation because I couldn't really um, well figure anything out looking at the topic of those uh, opinions is well for instance Austria Belgium and Slovenia that stand out as having quite a few uh, number of opinions um, I suspect that it could have to do with uh, them having introduced more reforms but also potentially with um, them being more zealous and more keen to uh, send their proposals to the uh, to the European uh, Central Bank Another uh, point I'd like to make uh, regarding practice so far is that if you look at the uh, annual reports of the ECB, you will see an interesting um, process of what I have uh, termed naming and shaming, whereby um, essentially the, the member states um, that have um, or are um, guilty of clear and important cases of non-consultation are being named. Um, they are very few. Uh, so we have um, yeah, five cases last year, three years, uh, three cases the year before, and five cases in 2020. So there are very few cases uh, where the member states apparently do not fulfill uh, their duty. And on the other hand, um, I think, um, and again, that's a hypothesis uh, from, for now, but uh, the question should be raised as to whether these are all cases, uh, because the report very clearly says uh, we're talking here about clear and important cases. So whether, um, um, yeah, there are not more uh, cases. So this, uh, um, I think this practice of naming and shame is, in, is interesting because it's, well, it's clearly a preventive measure and um, it's per perhaps a softer alternative to judicial uh, procedures before the, the Court of Justice for the uh, member states' failure to fulfill their obligation to consult the ECB. 
Now, uh, turning now uh, to my uh, conclusion and uh, looking at the uh, impact or the potential impact of those uh, opinions, uh, because as we've heard, they are not uh, well binding on the on the member states. Um, and uh, here I'd like to start with a disclaimer to say, well, it's quite difficult to assess the actual impact because obviously uh, it could be a case that you have uh, changes that are made to the national pieces of legislation that uh, are aligned with the ECB's opinions but uh, come from uh, the legislator, the national legislator. Um, however, I think it's fair to say that on the whole, uh, you do have uh, well, uh, some impact, as is visible from the various opinions that you may have on a on a, the same one and the same topic on various um, pieces of national legislation, but also the convergence reports that are being adopted by the ECB um, for those states that are not yet uh, part of the euro area every uh, other year, um, and. Um, on the other hand, um, we do see, if you look at the various opinions uh, issued by the ECB, you see that some issues remain. So some issues are still, uh, well, ag again, um, pointed out as uh, not being aligned uh, with the EU uh, framework. And um, I think that's uh, well one sign that uh, these are advisory opinions. So because the member states are still uh, free to follow those uh, or not. Um, and in some ways, I believe that this raises the question as to whether um, some opinions may be more non-binding than others. And by this, I mean that, um, well, arguably, if the the national piece of legislation has uh, is close, more closely related to one area, one of the core uh, tasks of the ECB, they should have a, a stronger impact. So meaning, for instance, if they are more closely related to monetary policy, central banking independence, etc., um, they should be uh, taken more into consideration by the member states than if it's an issue that um, only in the margin uh, has to do with what the ECB has, to, has as a task. Um, another um, point that I'd like to raise here is um, well, the duality in the um, in the national participation of uh, or the national representation uh, in this whole process because um, although as i said before we do have national representation in the whole procedure of the adoption of those uh, ecb opinions because the ecb opinions are adopted by the general council uh, by the governing council and therefore um, are also um, fed back into the uh, national central banks it's uh, the governors still belong to the national central banks and are not the legislative or the executive powers that are later on going to be in charge of uh, adopting uh, eventually those uh, national pieces of uh, legislation which raises uh, on the one hand the the issue of well, the circulation of information between the various uh, institutions at the national level and um, also shows that in this whole process of in some ways, peer review among central banks, among central bankers at the supranational level, the national uh, involvement is only in, indirect. And uh, that goes to show once more the dual nature, the dual EU and national nature of NCPs. Um, as I said before, on the other hand, um, well, the, in the, the preparation of those opinions is uh, most probably resource demanding for the ECB also because um, there is this timeline of um, one month, etc. So I was wondering and I wanted to put here in the room whether there wouldn't be some margin for uh, NCBs to feed more information into the uh, the whole process. Um, not necessarily, of course, uh, with a view to compensating for the government's failure to consult the ECB because I understand that this would be a problem at the national level. On the other hand, perhaps NCBs obviously uh, are more more closely uh, linked to what is going on at the national le level that the ECB could ever be. So perhaps there could be uh, some more um, horizontal as well as vertical um, cooperation of among uh, national and European central banks. And the last point I'd like to make here is um, perhaps a proposal or uh, some food for thought. Um, because while uh, preparing for the, this presentation, one thing that uh, came to mind was the fact that, um, well, like I said before, Arguably, the the ECB is more reliant in certain areas on the national structures than in other um, areas um, where it needs to uh, conduct or to fulfil certain tasks. Um, and therefore, I was 
wondering, and I wanted to, uh, to put this here, like I said, as food for thought, whether um, the ECB should not be uh, given the possibility to directly bring a member state to court in Luxembourg instead of uh, relying on the Commission, which again has this question to choose uh, to bring a member state to court for a failure to consult the ECB or not. So thank you very much. Quite an interesting <laughs> food, food for thought. Um, and now we will turn to uh, to David that will uh, dwell especially on the analysis of this mechanism from the point of view of what is soft law. And a very interesting one to be <laughs> researched on whether uh, to be articulated to the idea should we go for enforcement, but what is the nature of soft law and how it manifests itself in these kinds of interactions? Um, thank you very much. Um, Thank you very much to uh, Mr. Um, Fernandez Boyo for uh, for his introduction, and thank you very much to to Chiara and to Antonia for their invitation and to their excellent team for the organization of of this conference. It's, it is truly an honor uh, to be here. I also thank um, Diane for the uh, excellent introduction, which saves me a lot of trouble, and and for the practical analysis of ECB opinions. So my goal here is to more or less uh, bridge a gap between the practical uh, analysis of what ECB opinions are and then the remedial perspective that will be presented by uh, by uh, Miguel afterwards. So uh, hopefully providing some theoretical background to, to discuss. Uh, needless to say, um, I only include my academic affiliations because I speak on a strictly personal capacity and that, that, that should be stated, but it, it is important to restate it. Um, so to start with and, and to address this topic, ECB opinions as part of, of, of uh, soft law, um, um, uh, I, I'd like to start with, uh, with a quote from Oscar Wilde, uh, who said that, uh, I always pass on good advice. Uh, it is the only thing to do with it uh, because it's never uh, of any use to oneself. Um, I like uh, this quote, not just because it is fun and witty like Oscar Wilde was, but because it captures two ideas. Uh, that advice is something good uh, and worth sharing or giving. Uh, it is also something no one wants to own. So we like to share advice. We don't like to own advice very often. That that transpires through the um, provision of this advice. So in light of this, uh, I will try to discuss the ECB's advisory function uh, in light of its text, context, and purpose briefly, and then talk about the role of opinions and, and, and soft law in a shared normative space and how this uh, normative space has evolved in the case of the ECB and what may be the uh, implications for external controls and, and accountability, hopefully paving the way for some of the topics that uh, Miguel uh, will address uh, afterwards. So um, the text uh, has already been uh, discussed by, uh, by Diane. We have um, uh, section four of article 127, which talks about the advisory function in the ECB's fields of competence. Uh, Article 282 uh, talks about areas falling within its responsibility. So there's a little bit of uh, difference in the in the wording of the provisions. And then this uh, is complemented by the context, which is section two of Article 127, which refers to tasks. Uh, those tasks include monetary policy, foreign exchange operations, foreign reserves, uh, payment systems, and we see this to a certain extent replicated in the council decision, art, uh, article two, on the uh, duty to consult by member states with a, I would say, uh, vague uh, or ambiguous reference to rules applicable to financial institutions insofar as they materially influence the stability of financial institutions and markets. So this is probably one of the fields where probably the council decision has not kept up with the times in light of the ECB's prominent function when it comes to a prudential supervision of, of financial institutions. Um, so when it comes to the purpose of the advisory uh, function, um, it 
uh, what we have is the decision in the Olaf case, which I believe uh, uh, Miguel will also address. Uh, the ECB contested the, uh, the applicability of, of a legislative act to the creation of an anti-fraud office because the ECB was not consulted. And in two paragraphs, uh, very succinct but very insightful, the Court of Justice laid its vision of the role of the ECB's uh, advisory function, saying that it is ensured that the legislature adopts the act only when the body, uh, when the body has been heard that by virtue of the specific functions uh, has a high degree of expertise and is particularly well placed to play a useful role in the legislative process. But the ECB had not been assigned any specific tasks on the prevention of fraud. So that's, that's uh, what the court told us. And naturally, there are different potential readings of, of, this, uh, of this vision. So one is a constitutional reading saying there is a sort of immutable core of competencies that should not be encroached upon, a sort of institutional balance reading. A functional reading basically saying that if the ECB has been conferred uh, or transferred specific tasks, then the consistency in the application of those tasks should not be jeopardized by a failure to consult. But there is also a third informational uh, reading, which is that to the extent that the ECB has expertise in a certain area, it should be consulted. We will come back to these uh, possible readings of, of, the, um, of the YOLAP ruling um, afterwards. So, um, when it comes to trying to address the role of, of opinions, um, I think that opinions are part of, of uh, uh, the soft law of, uh, that emanates from, from the ECB. And uh, to a certain extent, to understand the role of soft laws, it is important to transcend purely positivistic ideas that rely on a rule of recognition that differentiates between legal norms and non-legal norms. And I propose that one possibility is to, to uh, think uh, about uh, social norms as understood by, for example, Christina Bicchieri as formed by conditional uh, beliefs, um, behavioral expectations, what behavior will be followed by agents, legislative or not, and normative expectations about what behaviors ought to be followed. So to that extent, soft law would contribute to the formation of social norms and may crystallize into uh, legal norms that meet uh, the rule of recognition. So how can uh, soft law uh, in general and opinions in particular uh, contribute to this? Uh, I think that as a source of information as a source of coordination and as a source of authority. So how, how would this work? Uh, as a one, by allowing diffusion and concentration of information that is otherwise dispersed. So this function uh, does not have a specific structure. So different policy making bodies, different agencies and authorities may disseminate information stating their opinions or views on a certain issue. And these may be picked up by legislative bodies or policy making bodies. But two, uh, soft law also allows coordination by non producing institution. And, and this function, I think, is specific to the role that each institution occupies in the system. So it is not simply a dissemination of information. So there is a certain structure to this, uh, this perspective of, of soft law. And therefore, we can have horizontal uh, coordination, uh, for example, through MOUs, vertical coordination through guidelines and recommendations directed to national authorities. But we could also have mm, multi-directional uh, coordination in the form of uh, joint policy making, but also in the form of uh, consultation and, and opinions. Three, by acting as a source of authority, uh, but not in the positive sense of RAS, of exclusionary reasons, but perhaps in the sense uh, of the broader sense of first order reasons to act that somehow uh, impose a burden to come up with alternative reasons not to follow this authoritative advice. This is the way that authority is, is formulated. So why, why is this relevant? Uh, because even if we tend to speak of soft law in general terms, uh, I think that the 
relevance of specific pieces of soft law depend on their function and at least the, their coordination and authoritative functions depend on soft law's place in the system. So what is that place would be the, the next question. Um, and, and I think that this depends on what I call shared normative space, which is a fancy term partly uh, adopted from uh, an article by uh, Rosie and, and, and Freeman that tries, to, uh, that tries to explain the role of multiple acts by different bodies, not as a source of duplication and redundancy, so as a, as a way of saying the same thing several times, but as a way to acknowledge the complexity of certain regulatory tasks and promote information production and compromise solutions on the face of the impossibility or undesirability to concentrate uh, the non-producing tasks. Hmm. So uh, from this perspective, uh, the role of the of ECB uh, opinions and soft law may depend on the ECB's shared uh, normative space uh, and thus this is tricky because rather than a single ECB normative space or shared normative space the ECB's normative space is, is comprised by three superimposed normative spaces so one first the original or core space is defined by the central banking space formed by the ECB and the national central banks with a relatively uh, inward looking dimension so ecb speaking to national central banks and and vice versa to the european system of financial supervisors where uh, the ecb in the design takes a relatively secondary uh, role because it is the european supervisory authorities that have the main uh, contributory function uh, by means not only of proposals but also of advisory responsibilities. The ECB would act more indirectly through the European Systemic Risk Board, for example, by way of, of opinions, but less so directly. But on top of this, then, there is the space of the banking union where the ECB retains direct supervisory responsibilities, intrusive responsibilities and a direct interaction with the uh, agents in, in the marketplace. So this somehow makes for a difficulty of finding a sort of consistent uh, view of what the ECB's shared normative space is and therefore what the role of opinions is in that uh, shared uh, normative space. Um, so in that sense, uh, this is uh, important because in the initial stages, we could see that the ECB uh, adopted some soft law acts for its coordination mostly with national central banks, and its opinions acted as a sort of external underpinning with the interplay with legislators for uh, an interaction with national central banks that was relatively uh, internal. With the financial crisis uh, and then the advent of the single supervisory mechanism, uh, there has been a lot more external projection. Uh, by external, I mean interplay with market players directly, and that has led to a proliferation of ECB soft law acts that uh, have, were systematized by uh, by uh, Rins Bass and, and Andreas Ritte in a in a very uh, enlightening uh, contribution. So, the ECB shared normative space has expanded as a matter of practice, and even if ECB opinions still perform the same role, uh, if the space have ex has expanded as a matter of practice, the question is whether this is relevant as a matter of law. So this is. Uh, the way I see this. And uh, this depends on how we define the role of uh, external controls and accountability and its interplay with soft law. Um, one idea that uh, I propose to you for, as, a, as a basis for discussion is that um, in this regard, uh, legal accountability acts as a sort of a flip side of soft law function, that is to ensure the soft law 
performs the functions it should, that is information coordination and an authority, but at the same time does not become an open door for disinformation, breach of procedure, abuse or misuse of powers. So in this way, controls, uh, I think, are contingent on the function that soft law uh, performs in the system and the sensi sensitivity of this function to the configuration of the shared normative space. So what would be uh, the implications of this? In the case of the information function, I think that uh, the control of the information function is less sensitive to the shape of the normative space. Information is diffused and then is uh, taken on board by uh, different uh, legislative or policy making bodies. But there is not pre assigned role to the party that is providing the information, provided it is a uh, um, uh, provided it is a non-producing authority. And this is why I think that the General Court was correct in finding in Steinhoff that ECB opinions could be an actionable, uh, uh, could be actionable under the action for damages for uh, non-contractual liabilities. I also think that the court was, was right in saying that even though the threshold for justiciability would be set relatively low, so to speak, the threshold for liability would be set high, and I would stress in this case, quite high. Um, apart from agreeing with this assessment, uh, my only comment as to the challenges uh, ahead is that although the court is right in shaping the action for non-contractual liability as with a common ground, uh, sometimes the basis for the action on non-contractual liability is not entirely suited for the specificities of liability for misinformation or liability for misstatements, which normally are related to the uh, attached importance to the materiality of the information or the fact of whether that information is relied upon uh, or reasonably relied upon by parties, uh, for example, market uh, parties. Uh, the second aspect that has to do with the uh, coordination uh, role is, uh, has to do with the relevance of ECB opinions in the legislative and regulatory uh, process. And here, I think it depends on the ECB's role in the shared normative space. So here we go back to OLAF and the different potential readings that we have. And, and I think that uh, the Court uh, I uh, was uh, correct in leaving the door open not only for a purely constitutional reading or a sort of reading of the advisory function as sort of crystallizing a core central banking function that is uh, set in stone from day one and uh, remains forever, but instead a functional uh, perspective that uh, is more related to the specific tasks that are conferred uh, and uh, on, on the ECB. Now, naturally, uh, the challenge with this and the flip side of this is the need for caution uh, about the consequences, because although it is my view that uh, the ECB should now be consulted on its areas uh, where it performs uh, function and tasks, concrete functions and, and tasks uh, as a matter of legislation and practice, um, the consequences of a failure to consult are quite drastic. And I think that uh, Miguel will elaborate on this. So if, if we combine the expanded uh, shared normative space where the ECB operates with uh, the drastic consequences of, of uh, the failure to consult, we could increase uh, the, the uh, a very gray area of potentially zombie uh, legislation that is invalid for the mere fact of a failure to consult the ECB. And this is not uh, an insignificant consequence of, of applying uh, an expanded uh, normative space uh, in, in the context of uh, the control of the duty to consult the ECB. So, in terms of uh, reaching my conclusions, uh, I have tried to address uh, the role of ECB 
the ECB advisory role and uh, the role of its opinions as part of its uh, soft law. Uh, it can, I believe that soft law can be a useful source of information, coordination and authority. Uh, and those functions are partly dependent, at least, on the form and shape of the ECB shared normative space, which I think is not immutable. It has been evolved with time as more tasks and functions have been transferred. Uh, and this, in my view, affects the uh, judicial control of uh, maybe not so much the information function, but at least the coordination function. Uh, I hope that uh, there were some uh, ideas in this pre presentation that you found useful. And uh, in any event, please remember that I am just passing on advice. Thank you very much. <laughs> Uh, thank you, David. And now uh, we are going with uh, Miguel to see really uh, well, what to think about this more bindingness in some cases or not, uh, or consequences of uh, expanding uh, the, the weight that is given to, to the opinion. So please, Miguel. Thank you very much and good morning to, to everyone. I would like also to thank the European Central Bank for this kind invitation to this uh, distinguished uh, uh, legal conference and also to thank the, the ECB because in the recent years I have more the opportunity to listen than to speak. <laughs> so today I'm speaking and you will be judging. So so don't be too tough. Um, so the first thing that I wanted to say is that uh, I need to, to make a clear, uh, clear disclaimer. So I'm not currently dealing with any banking cases. And the second disclaimer I wanted to say is that my opinion today is based basically on the uh, dozen of articles that have been produced concerning the legal consequences of uh, not uh, uh, asking or requesting an opinion by the ECB, either by the national legislators or by the EU legislator, and also on the case law, the current stage of the case law of the European Court of Justice, meaning that for the time being this may evolve and also my thinking may evolve according, according to that. So um, what I would like to, to, to draw your attention today, and I think Diane and also David helped me a lot on, on I don't know if it's working. No. Okay. So, so I, I will specifically address the, the 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 case law on the obligation to consult uh, by uh, legislators or to inform a legislator to the institutions, uh, agencies, or EU bodies. Which I think it's an important element to take into into consideration. And to do so, what I'm trying to do is uh, is testing a little bit from the legal point of view. Is it a valid argument what is stated in the guide on consultation by the ECB? At the end of this guide produced by the ECB, there is a reference of the potential legal consequences, which I must say that are quite dramatic, uh, when uh, the national legislator or even the EU legislator does not consult the, the ECB. Basically, in this, in this guide, it is stated that in that case, the, the legislation uh, should be declared void. So I think this is an important uh, element to discussion, and I will try to test this according to, to the current uh, situation of the case law. And after that, I will make a reference to the legal implications and also the possible uh, remedies, and I would like to make some overall comments at the end. So uh, as regards the legal framework, I, I, I'm not going to, to enter into the details because it has already been said by the previous speakers. I think also concerning the nature of the ECB opinion, also David mentioned the, the, this uh, recent case law by the General Court, but it was clearly stated and clearly established that the opinions by the ECB are non-binding, which I think it results uh, already from Article 288. What I think it is important, and it is uh, basically an element that also David already introduced, is how we should interpret the judgment by the Court of Justice in the Olaf case. And this is a, uh, an important, I think, element in, in our discussion today on this, on this particular topic, because we have uh, on, on one hand the opinion by Advocate General Jacobs in this case, where it states clearly that it was not contested by neither party in the case, and, and he also confirmed that in his opinion, the, the, the requirement to consult the ECB according to the, to the primary law is an essential procedural requirement and failure to provide this uh, request, it should mean that the legislation is void. So the, 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 the opinion is quite clear on, uh, on this question. On the contrary, then we have the, the judgment and, and we have these two points that David already mentioned, which did not uh, 
answer this specific element, but uh, somehow uh, uh, I think centered the, uh, the, the the analysis or, or, the, or of this uh, of, of this requirement to the particular function behind the the the, the, the behind the, the provision of the treaties, and and then one can discuss whether there is a constitutional interpretation, uh, functional, or other. But the, the court did not conclude precisely on this element of uh, stating if lack to consult the ECB is uh, breaching an essential procedural requirement. So trying to, to, to test this, uh, I said, as I said, this assumption that is in the, in the guide to consult by the ECB, I, I, I think it is interesting to, to take a look at the case law on primary law that the ECJ has produced uh, on uh, as regards the, the obligations to consult that exist in the in the treaties, and and I think there are two two cases that I I, I would like to I would like to to mention, um, because there are there's different case law uh, um, where the court of justice has already analysed when you have to consult either the European Parliament, the Council, the uh, um, Economic and Social Committee. And, and, and also the Commission. And I think the, the two important cases that I would like to draw your attention, the first one is the Roquet Fred case, which is a milestone judgment, which is well, well known because uh, it established clearly what is the role of the European Parliament. And what is interesting in this case is that in the Roquet Fred case, um, um, for the first time, uh, the Court of Justice has said that uh, precisely because the Parliament has this uh, uh, role as a, uh, to, to comply with the principle of uh, democratic representation, um the consequence the consequence not to consult the the ep by the council is that uh, uh the, the, there was a breach on, on on an essential formality disregard of which uh meant that the measure concern was void so it was the first time that the that the, the court of justice established this important or dramatic uh, consequence of not of not consulting the second judgment which is i think also interesting in in our discussion today is Precisely another milestone judgment is the Costa Enel case, which also analyzed article, the previous uh, Article 93, Paragraph 3 of the treaty. It concerned uh, state aids. And, and, and interpreting this article, uh, the, the, the Court of Justice also said that uh, this paragraph conferred rights to the citizens, so they could, the, the conferring rights to the citizens, they had the right to be protected by national courts. So it also established for the first time the possibility that when there is uh, in the treaties an obligation in this case to consult an institution and to wait until the and, until the institution takes a decision on that this conferes to the cities that might be protected by the national courts and then there is uh, also additional case law i will not enter into the details concerning the the obligations uh, to consult according to articles 114 and 117 which basically also establish that failure to uh, consult cannot be in benefit of the national authorities. On the other side, there is also an important bunch of case law uh, uh, on secondary law. And here there are two uh, cases which I think are important because they uh, help us to differentiate some obligations, whether we are in front of an evaluation just to inform or we are in front of an evaluation to consult and also because they're behind that, there is an obligation uh, somehow to monitor a procedure, or there is uh, an uh, there is some kind of uh, uh, obligation for an institution or an agency or a body to uh, adopt a decision explicitly or implicitly. And the two cases I'm referring uh, are a special uh, Anaheim based case and also the Dimon and Fromen case. So in those in those cases, and especially the first one, because it was the first one in which the Court of Justice uh, had to 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 distinguish these two, two elements. Uh, the Court of Justice uh, um, analyzed the directive. It was a, it was the directive on, 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 on waste. And uh, uh, an Italian court requested a preliminary ruling to the Court of Justice asking whether if the fact that a municipality of Italy had adopted some, some, some plans to, to restrict the plastic bags might be affected by the fact that the directive uh, uh, provided an obligation to consult the commission to, to inform the commission on any waste plans adopted by the member states and the court of justice analyzed this directive analyzed the wording and the purpose of the directive and concluded that the, uh, in this case there was only an obligation to inform the commission so she is aware about the different 
plans adopted by the member states in order to take in the future maybe an, uh, modifications of the legislation or it has to if they have to change the, the harmonization uh, uh, the the harmonized legislation so it clearly differentiate what is the purpose behind the uh, consultation if it's only an obligation to inform then you cannot declare that the legislation is void but on the contrary if behind the purpose of that uh, requirement it, it, there is the, 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 an obligation from the institution to take a decision or to control something then you might consider that it might be bought and this is important because this case will also discuss for uh, the following case law from the court of justice in order to differentiate over these two points uh, a similar approach was also adopted by the court of justice in this case concerning the directive on the protection of employees in case of insolvency of the employer demon and from men and on the contrary when interpreting the directive on the tva the court of justice uh, considered that there was uh, there was a uh, it was a case where a national a national legislator adopted a derogation from the directive but did not inform the commission and in this case the the, 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 the judgment from the court of justice considered that in this case as there was a process to authorize a derogation from the directive any uh, uh, derogation implemented by a national legislator which had not been consulted to the commission and obtained this authorization was to be considered void maybe what is uh, even more important is the, the bunch of, of cases that the Court of Justice has produced on, on, in the area of technical regulations. So the, in 1983, 1998, and 2015, there's been a directive which establishes a procedure when the member states uh, adopt technical regulations which might affect uh, the, the uh, which might affect goods and so it might, uh, might affect the freedom of movement of goods. And precisely uh, through different uh, pre uh, preliminary rulings, uh, the Court of Justice has established more clearly maybe these uh, this, uh, uh, legal consequences uh, that we are qualifying as uh, quite dramatic. And the first case where this was established was the CIA international security case in 1996, not in 2014. And uh, uh, in this case, uh, for the first time, maybe and more, more particularly, uh, very clearly, the, the the Court of Justice established that uh, the fact that a national uh, legislator, in this case it was the Belgian state, adopted some technical regulations that affected uh, uh, some uh, the, the, the free movement of goods, uh, were to be considered void because uh, the Belgian authorities fail to consult the Commission and also the member states. We have, uh, according to these uh, directives, a uh, deadline in order to uh, produce uh, an opinion to uh, suggest making amendments in order to avoid any obstacle to the free movement of of, uh, of trade. It is also important in this case because for the first time, the commission and the sorry the the court of justice in a clear manner uh, used the effect util interpretation in order to uh, uh, to base this uh, legal consequence. Because this is quite dramatic as a consequence, there is a subsequent case law which has uh, somehow limited or clarify this 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 uh, uh, consequence so for example in the lemons case the the, the court of justice clarified for example that uh, even though there is this legal consequence this not does not Im impede that for example an apparatus that was approved according to, to a technical regulation that was not notified to the commission could be used as evidence in a criminal proceeding so meaning that the court of justice is conscious that sometimes there might be some many different implications but it, it somehow uh, uh, limited the effects of, of of the first declaration also in the in the ins case concerning the gambling sector the court of justice somehow also uh, limited or limited or clarified this this uh, uh, this legal consequence uh, 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 stating that when you have a, a law that has been passed without this, uh, with uh, failing to notify uh, uh, according to uh, legal, uh, 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 according to the technical regulations that directive, is not the whole law that is void, but it's only the specific parts of the law that provide for the technical regulations. So the, 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 the case law limits also the effects to the specific elements that might be affected by the opinion of the Commission and the Member States. 
And another uh, interesting and, and recent uh, case that has been produced by the, by the Court of Justice is the Air, Airbnb Ireland case. It's a recent case adopted by the Great Chamber in 2019. And this one concerned the directive on the information, uh, uh, information society services, where there is also some kind of uh, uh, obligation to consult before adopting some regulations that might affect the uh, information society services. And in this case, um, the Court of Justice uh, precisely uh, make reference to the anyhow based case that I mentioned before to clarify that you have to always look at the wording and the purpose of the legislation to clearly differentiate what is behind the obligation to consult and according to that then you might take some legal consequences and in this case he considered that the, the main purpose of the legislation is to avoid uh, that uh, member states can adopt obstacles to trade but also and this i think it also is also important in our context to impinge the the competence of another member state which is normally the member state who has the, the power to regulate the information uh, society provider that that, that provides service in another member state. So also the question of competence is an, an important element to take into consideration. So uh, to conclude to those, all, all these elements, maybe what, what I would say is that either from the primary law case, the case law that analyzes the obligation to consult, uh, to consult under primary law and under secondary law, the, the Court of Justice takes especially into consideration which, are, which is the purpose behind it which is the wording and the purpose behind the obligation to consult. And for example, in the, in the Olaf case, it states clearly that the legislature adopts the act only when the body has been heard. So it is, I think it, 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 it focuses the, the analysis on this purpose. So in that case, and as I said, it might be possible that uh, in a case where there is a, a lack of consultation of the ECB, it could be challenged that in that case, this uh, article from the from, from from primary law may confer rights to to the citizens, may confer rights to the agents, and so in some cases you could uh, you could uh, legally uh, uh, state that the legislation may be void and unforceable. How could you, I mean, uh, challenge all this? Of course, there are several possibilities. The first one is not mentioned here, but it's concerning national uh, legislation. It's the, uh, the, the the cornerstone of the system, the premier ruling. It's been basically how the, all this case law has been developed in the Technical Regulations Directive. A second possibility is uh, to bring an action uh, of a, for an almond. Of course, it could be an action that could be bring from one of the uh, institutions or bodies of the European Union. Potentially, one could think about uh, maybe an individual or a company, but this may, there is another problem. The, the problem of locus standi, I cannot maybe uh, go into details here, but this is a, a clear problem. The second element is what with the object. The object could be the, the, the piece of legislation produced by the, by the EU legislator. Some, some authors have questioned whether if you can contest a delegated act, which has been, not, which has been adopted without uh, uh, the prior consultation of the ECB. And this is a legal question that might be maybe clarified. And then uh, there is another possibility, which is maybe much more clear for an individual or for, uh, for an agent in the market, which is the use of, of the plea of inegality according to Article 241. So in a, in, a, in a challenging a specific decision that applies a legislation that has not been notified, you could be, it could be possible, as it was the case for the ECB in the Olaf case, to, uh, to, uh, to somehow uh, contest the possibility to, to apply this legislation uh, according to, to the case law that we just saw. Another element that we have to take into consideration is they also have the infringement procedures. I mean, the Commission, for example, uh, has brought different member states uh, uh, before the Court of Justice in the case of the Technical Regulations uh, Directive and, and the Court of Justice finally condemned the member states failing to notify legislation. This is a possibility. There is also the, well, the, the, the specific case of the ECB uh, potentially uh, uh, um, uh, starting an infringement procedure to a national central bank. And then finally, other, other, uh, there are other areas where, where this, this problem can be, can be raised. It's, for example, the, the possibility to ask for damages. We already, I mean, David already mentioned that there is also a difficulty behind that. It's uh, the difficulty of the threshold uh, that is established by the case law considering that. But uh, as the Steinhoff case has already said, you cannot uh, exclude that somebody can ask for compensation of, of damages caused for a breach of a 
and a treaty obligation, provided that all the all the different conditions established by Article 268 and the case law of the Court of Justice are, 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 are complied with. So to, to, to conclude, uh, as an overall comment, I think we are uh, uh, now, and I think David already, already pointed that, uh, in, in a situation where we don't really know what the Olaf case implications are. I mean, what, what it is clear, it is that the, that the Court of Justice has established that there is an obligation to consult concerning the specific task assigned to the ECB, but we don't know if this can be construed finally as an essential procedural requirement. Uh, concerning the question that the guide consultation of the ECB uh, produces, is the case law on un enforceability of uh, non-notified legislation in other areas applicable to this situation? I think it could be a valid argument, as I said, because if we analyze the wording and the purposes, uh, and, and specifically because if we analyze the council decision, Article 4 establishes a clear obligation, for example, for member states, national, for, for national authorities to ensure the compliance with that decision, and this is quite similar to what is established in the in the um, technical regulations directive. Then other questions may arise, for example, a dilemma, what happens if the ECB is confronted to a situation where he has to apply a non-notified national legislation? And another question that I think uh, David also addresses: is what is the impact of all this in the new areas of competence for the ECB? And then concerning the legal actions, I think in the in the in the future, uh, you can you know, we cannot uh, exclude that there will be a, a preliminary ruling, probably uh, maybe challenging all these questions. Maybe we'll get uh, some clear some clear answers. Thank you. Well, uh, thank you, and may I extend the thanks to all the three because you have really kept <laughs> the time frame that <laughs> that we had in mind more or less, so that we have time time for having questions. Uh, I, I must say that uh, I, I wanted to to raise two questions on behalf of uh, Chiara, who wanted <laughs> to raise but had uh, to leave unfortunately. So I will begin uh, for that and then uh, ask if you want <laughs> to cross there and also the audience. Um, Chiara was very interested by your expression "more binding than others." <laughs> of uh, uh, some uh, aspects that are more binding than others, and uh, he wanted to uh, to ask you, uh, but others feel free to express whether you think that one indicator of the fact that uh, uh, the, there is this more binding <laughs> thing uh, would be that. Uh, in addition to the generic legal basis of 127.4 in the treaty, there can be other legal basis saying for this thing, really, you need to consult the ECBs. So where the existence of a different legal basis additional to 127 could be one of these. I, I would extend that. Really. I think that this is more or less what is also said in by specific task. But, but maybe um, certainly if there is a specific legal basis basis for consulting, it should be that it is uh, more or less, but maybe not, uh, <laughs> related to the idea of the specific task uh, uh, in the uh, in the OLAF uh, thing. Um, second question <laughs> that uh, uh, sh she wanted to to relate to that, but also to the uh, to your uh, developments on on the nature of soft law is whether the timing <laughs> of the consultation is not uh, an essence uh, of an essence in the consultation. I mean, uh, uh, th that is, if you really th value, and I think this is will be for the uh, also for the specific task. Uh, but if you really value the fact that you should re uh, receive an independent uh, uh, advice for, uh, by uh, by the ECB for the colleges later than the moment <coughs> where it is. <laughs> could be uh, important. So uh, if it's too late, I mean, <laughs> um, in the process, uh, uh, the, maybe this could also be problematic from the point of view of uh, ensuring the, the effectiveness of uh, uh, the idea. And to this, I, I wanted to, to add uh, uh, myself a, a question specifically <laughs> uh, for um, Miguel. Um, for me, you said, would you have to apply? <laughs> Uh, uh, consultation and uh, legislation that has not been consulted. Here we really have an issue for banking supervision. So that's uh, what I think. That uh, the legislation we have to apply is the transposition legislation. But on the other side, uh, 
we have case law that says for transposition legislation you don't have to uh, to uh, uh, to reconstruct. Uh, but it is a very practical issue because in the transposition you have a lot of divergence, as I said, <laughs> and we will have to apply the divergence. And we only know the divergence when we have the transposition, <laughs> uh, not before, not at the moment where <laughs> where we are giving the, or, or advice on, on the directive. So here we have a conundrum that for the efficiency, this is exactly the thing. <laughs> We, it is more important for us uh, to, to be consulted, but this is where it is not mandatory, clearly. <laughs> uh, in so, so here we, this is a uh, yeah, kind of conundrum to, for us. So uh, maybe you can uh, begin further by the first Chiara question. On... Um, no, thanks a lot. Yeah, I think I'd like to first uh, react to your last point, if okay. I may, um, because, uh, yeah, I think you're raising the, the point that was slightly, I mean, I think that was underlying the whole of our presentations and in some ways, and the, you, David, you mentioned it, we have an, a misalignment between the, the framework that exists and the way the ECB has evolved. And I, I fully agree with you that uh, supervision is probably one of the areas in which the ECB should be uh, consulted in, uh, in the case of uh, transposition measures as well. Um, but um, that then leads me to, to Chiara's question, um, I must admit I had not thought about it, but probably if you have an additional, because this generic consultation uh, obligation to consult is naturally also uh, comes on top of the other um, obligations. And yeah, that's probably an element uh, to be taken into account. Uh, yeah, I, I think, um, again, um, the question is a lot more intelligent than the answer that you're going to get, uh, I'm afraid, um, uh, because you've had uh, the time to to think about it. I, I think that that the uh, taking a step back, the 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 core issue is whether uh, the uh, duty to consult is is a sort of a discrete requirement. Either there is a duty or there is not. If there is, then uh, there is a breach of procedural requirements and so on or whether it is something that can be calibrated depending on the role that consultation plays in the system and depending on the potential consequence of lack of consultation, meaning in this case a misinformed piece of legislation. So if we adopt that discrete perspective, then uh, timing, whether it is as long as it is done within the uh, legal frame, uh, then it, it is of no consequence. But my view is that the duty to consult should not be understood in such a rigid way, but also in light of the role that consultation plays in the system. I think that even in the cases of the Parliament, the, the Court of Justice stresses that it is not just consultation of the Parliament per se, but consultation because the Parliament is the repository of democratic legitimacy. So there is a finality to the duty to consult. And this finalistic perspective uh, is, is also important to assess the consequence of no consultation. So from that more finalistic perspective, I would agree that the timing of the consultation is important when assessing whether the duty has been complied properly and, and the consequences uh, of, of, of it. So that's, uh, that, that would be my uh, initial reaction. Yes, maybe on, on the timing, I would I would add yeah. two things. Eh? The first thing is that we have Article 4 from the 98 uh, Council decision that states that uh, ex-member states shall uh, take the necessary measures to ensure effective compliance with uh, the decision and also it establishes that to that end, it shall ensure that the ECB is consulted at an appropriate stage. So there is the, some room to interpret in that. <laughs> and so, and, and, and I have to say from, from the case law I, I just mentioned, the, the, until now, the Court of Justice takes a lot of attention to the purpose which is behind. So, so this and the effect to deal was an, a key element, as I said, in some on, in some of the cases. And maybe another element also important is that in the Roquette Fred case, uh, the Court of Justice there was a question whether the Council requested the opinion, but did not wait until the Parliament uh, adopted the opinion because it was at the end of the legislature. Of the legislature. So, what the what the Court of Justice said it is it, it's not enough just to request. Okay. You have to exhaust. It says you have. To, it is essential to exhaust all the possibilities to obtain the preliminary opinion. That's what 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 it was said by by the Rockefeller case. But just to mention a little bit that that timing has been also questioned in some of the case law that uh, that uh, I have addressed. For for each other before I open to to the audience, no. 
No? Okay. Well, <laughs> we only have five minutes, so maybe <laughs> in ten minutes. <laughs> but uh, you were the first, and we have a lot of, <laughs> of questions, so please see. The same could, could you, Check. even if you're very <laughs> well known, could you? Hey, Christos Hadzi Manuel from uh, the Bank of Greece and uh, the University of Piraeus. Uh, two very specific uh, questions. Um, the exams that you have given by way of analogy uh, seem to me to present a significant difference from uh, how the duty is framed in the treaty in relation to the ECB. In the case of primary law, they relate to particular procedures. And in the case of secondary law, they relate to very specific areas of the law. But doesn't it make a difference that in this particular case we have a blanket uh, treaty provision, uh, not only a blanket provision, but also one which is not, it is quite ill specified in terms of its subject matter, areas of competence. What are the ECB's areas of competence? This is something that needs to be clarified. Uh, and uh, in any case, uh, an interpretation of this clause shouldn't be uniform across the various competences. This is the one. And the second thing is, I did not really understand your point about the implications for national legislation. It, it appeared to me uh, that you somehow raised the possibility that the national legislation might be questioned uh, in terms of validity, would this be conceivable? Shouldn't um, the right remedy be an infringement action? Uh, could uh, uh, national legislation be invalidated on European grounds? Please continue because the weather. Thank you. Uh, you yes, sure. Okay, so Elena Sedano from the European University Institute, and uh, this would be uh, for David Ramos. Um, but in view uh, of maybe of the obligation uh, to consult the ECB. So it's, it's a little bit of an abstract uh, question. Um, how much is the shared normative space of the ECB a formal rationality? Does this regards in the end a substantive rationality? Um, talking about knowledge, uh, as you said, it's dispersion and its concentration. How much the shared normative space of the ECB endorses a bias of an economic culture that is foreclosing alternatives? And how much is the same legal framework impeding these alternatives to take shape? Is there a formal rationality leading the ECB to stand by a financial system that creates imbalances? First and foremost, the impossibility to act promptly when faced uh, by the environmental imperative or when faced by a staggering level and ever growing level of wealth inequalities, uh, or still in front of rule of law issues, contradictions, and incoherencies, incoherencies within uh, its mandate. So the question basically is uh, shouldn't the ECB and uh, EU institutions more broadly take a more substantive approach to the economy and less formalistic, uh, thinner when it regards uh, to the law focusing more on legal principles than on many complex rules and norms? And do you think this would lead uh, to a tangible risk of capture uh, or instrumentalization of the law? Thank you. Daniel Guhisi be a slightly provocative question related to what we consider the soft character of ECB opinions. I feel uh, what uh, Professor Fomash has identified are exactly those type of cases the, where ECB opinions are less than soft. Some ECB opinions are not so soft. And uh, those are in particular two cases. First, the program countries, Cyprus, Ireland, Portugal, where what ECB said about legislative proposals was a de facto part of legislative conditionality and would be followed quite uh, quite thoroughly. And secondly, maybe less visible uh, because it's of interest to specific countries, it's, it's pre-accession cases. 
uh, where uh, what actually is asked of ECB is a legal certainty about certain detailed issues, such as, for example, the conditions for central bank backstop to deposit guarantee schemes, and what an, what both sides, the consulting member state and the ECB, achieve in such an opinion is de facto, one may argue, a sort of technical legislative standard about how far you could go, for example, with central bank backstop for DGS, and both sides would follow this uh, because of uh, accession process, the, the convergence reports, etc. So, uh, are those really soft law instruments in those cases? Many thanks. So, so, I don't know, three more, and then that, that's the end. So, begin there. Um, another, Julian, Deutsche Bundesbank, just another question regarding the soft law character, because in particular in the institutional field where the ECB has built, in particular in the field of monetary financing, uh, kind of, of yeah, rules for the national lawmaker. And we had a case when actually the ECJ then said, okay, we don't accept these rules. And since there are so few cases actually brought to the ECJ, such a change then really changes the world for, for what has been granted for quite a while. Do you see a problem in these uh, kind of established ECB opinions that form the legal landscape and then are totally turned over by the ECJ? Thanks. I had one there and one there and that's it. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, my name is Dominik Baca from the uh, National Central Bank of uh, Slovakia. I have a simple question, um, which will be as follows. Uh, can a national court, and we spoke uh, about this yesterday, uh, contest the ECB opinion within the preliminary reference? Because uh, the article says that uh, the act of the uh, union institution bodies might be um, brought uh, uh, to the to the court of justice and opinions are acts so there is not um, said whether those acts have to be binding or not binding so this is my question not uh, it's not working <laughs> sorry Yes, Philippe Lefebvre, Belgian Central Bank. Uh, I must say, uh, uh, I must confess, I was a little bit puzzled by the idea that uh, the opinions would be uh, soft law. In fact, uh, of course, there is no definition of soft law, but uh, soft law is supposed to have uh, an impact on the, the subjects of uh, the, the, the regulation, uh, even if it's not binding, because there we fall in the another decision of the court of justice is uh, ecb against the united kingdom in the in the location policy that uh, uh, said clearly that uh, there is a, a principle of substance over law over form and uh, that uh, that um, and in this case as the ecb has no regulatory competence it it would not in fact issue soft law that is uh, that is binding um, but Regarding, in fact, the, the, the opinions on, 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 on national legislation to take that case, um, we are in a very specific context uh, because the opinion is given, in fact, of a draft uh, law. And uh, the opinion, there are two possibilities uh, of the, the consequence of that opinion. Or it is taken into account and then it becomes, in fact, art law. Oh, it is rejected, and then it is simply uh, a contra legem uh, opinion. Of course, it gives the uh, what the ICB thinks about one uh, thing, but uh, it is not uh, going beyond uh, that. To 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 my feeling. Okay, so <laughs> it says. And yeah, no, thanks a lot for these uh, excellent questions and a lot of uh, food for thought. I'll pick and choose, uh, if I may. Um, yeah, I think um, perhaps I, I'll answer the question by the person from the Bundesbank uh, regarding the well, when there is a change, basically, that is introduced by the Court of Justice. And I, I completely see your point, and I think you are referring to Banca Slovenia and uh, the case of uh, financial independence, etc. 
But on the other hand, I wonder whether this is so specific to the ECB. In a sense, you know, isn't it a case that whenever you have a, an interpretation, for instance, by the European Commission that is later on overturned by the Court of Justice, then you have a change of expectations, etc. So I see the problem, but I don't think this is so specific uh, to opinions. So, um, yeah. And uh, yeah, thanks for the, the examples uh, duly noted. Okay. So what we can, uh, what we can see uh, from the questions uh, by the audience is that uh, the um, softness of of uh, ECB opinions is is a, a matter of also of context. We've had examples where these opinions are not even soft law, so basically they can be uh, safely ignored. But even in those cases, there is a duty to consult. So that's uh, the hardness uh, that, uh, if, if anything. Whereas in other cases, the duty of consultation goes a step beyond that, because if it is uh, a specific country subject to specific uh, conditionality, then it has to comply with the opinion, in which case then the function of the opinion and that goes back to the point I, I made before. So it is not uh, uh, a general duty that can be assessed regardless of the circumstances. I think that the context of the duty to consult has to be assessed in the specific case and the uh, breach of the duty to consult has to be assessed in light of the finality of the duty in the in the concrete case. This is why I think that, uh, that the question by Professor Haji Manuel is, is right on point. It is a blanket duty included in the treaty instead of a specific duty included in a secondary act. If it were a, secondary, a duty included in a secondary act, then we could more easily assess uh, what the duty is there for and the consequences of a breach. In the absence of that, though, I think that we should not uh, simply apply <clears throat> a blanket understanding of a failure of the duty to consult, but assess it in the specific circumstances. I think that your examples were right on point uh, in, in that respect. So uh, thanks a lot for the, for the questions, incredibly informed questions. Thank you. Maybe to pop up to also also on the on this question, I, I um, yes, you can take into consideration the fact that the obligation to consult to consult is in this article 127, and that it is is it is quite different from what it exists in the directives. But I think we also have to we have to take into consideration that concerning national authorities, there is this reference to the council decision, and the council decision gives a context on how to produce this consultation in some areas, specific areas which are clearly identified. And also, and I didn't have the time to address very detailed, but there is this Article 4, which provides for uh, something that you have to, to obtain from this consultation, I think. This is the part of the of, of the of the context that might be taken into consideration. And considering this, maybe you can go to the legal consequences I mentioned. I'm not saying that the court judge will do it. But there is this Article 4 that, that, that provides for two clear obligations. The obligation to ensure that this consultation, that the, the decision is uh, effectively complied by the member states. And secondly, also that there is, uh, that the member states uh, ensure that there is an appropriate, that, that the consultation is done at an appropriate stage and also is taken into consideration for the, for the authority adopting the national legislation. So. So I think this this element will be also can play also a, a role on 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 this on this discussion we're having, and uh, secondly, and and I, I thank you for your for your question because maybe I, I was a little I was not precise. I think I think we have to differentiate two situations according to uh, to the article from the from the treaties. The first one is the consultation concerning EU legislation. There, uh, as the Olaf case mentioned, it, the, the the EU legislation might de be declared void. As a, and then concern nas, the national uh, authorities, then it could be applied this uh, case law that I mentioned by analogy, as it has, it has been the case, for example, in Airbnb, uh, Airbnb Ireland case, the CIA international security. What it would be said is that the, the legislation is enforceable in the precise case. So it's not. It's not. So that. So it's the clear or the, the normal uh, conclusion. But maybe because I was talking about the two legislation, maybe I was not. I, I was not precise. Thank you for your question. Thank you everybody for the questions and following it, but a special thanks for our panelists.